Let's take our Bibles, if you would please, turn to Romans 12. Romans 12, we're touching on the last spiritual gift that's mentioned in this particular list. There are more, and we do, we will deal with those more coming up in January. We'll actually start into 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to start in Romans uh, 12, verse 6, and, and let me just bring everybody up to speed real quick so we can do that. We're going through a series called The Gifts and the Body. The church is the body of Christ. That is the picture that is painted forward by the Apostle Paul at least three times in his writings. And the reason why that is is because Jesus Christ is the head. Now what I like about this word picture is that we can all readily relate. Because we all have a body and we all have a head. And we all know who runs the show. And so that clears the issue of authority over the body immediately. If you're not able to think it out first, if you're just willingly doing actions, that's usually an involuntary response and you need to go see Roxanne to get that checked out, right? But we even have situations where if you're legally on trial for something, they've allowed for something to be premeditated. You've thought it through. It's because we receive the authority and the direction from the top down. That's how it works. Well, Jesus Christ, having died on the cross for our sins, paid the perfect price for the penalty that we've incurred, and being gloriously resurrected from the dead by the power of God himself, has now done something exceedingly gracious on top of everything else that he's done. Again, there's about 40-something different things that happen to you when you become a believer in Christ. But one of the most amazing things, and one that I feel is either abused or greatly neglected, is the idea that every single person who's a believer in Christ has a spiritual gift, at least one. And the reason is, is because the body was never meant to be complacent. Has anybody ever seen the commercial where the kid is eating these chips? He's got a, I don't know, a side stash of ho-hos. He's got the deluxe biggie drink from, I don't know, Quick Trip maybe, I don't know. And he's at his grandma's house, and he runs out of his drink. Has anybody seen this commercial? And he picks up the phone, his cell phone, and he calls his grandma, who's three rooms down, and says, can you bring me some more Coke? Too often, that is the body of Christ, absorbed with junk. Unwilling to move. But our head's telling us we got to do something about our deficiency. And so instead of getting moving, we call in a lot of situations of people who have no business doing that job. So I would like to think that she went out and strung him up by his toes. Because that's what needed that. We don't see that part of the commercial, but that's what needed to happen. Imagine that's where it went. So we've actually discovered that there are 11 gifts. We have five speaking gifts. We have six serving gifts. In fact, we have a little wheel, an amazing pie chart that Emily has crafted for us uh, in order to represent that so you can see what that is. You've done an excellent job on this, Emily. Seriously, I'll throw an idea at her. She comes up with amazing stuff. It's beautiful. So if you've never congratulated or thanked Emily for how amazing she is in serving here, please take the time to do that. Don't clap for her now. That takes away from what we're doing. Tell her after. Good grief. Might go to her head and I don't know. So, Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Since we, notice that pronoun, Paul includes himself and he doesn't exclude anybody. Since we have gifts that differ, differing gifts are okay. Because it's according to the grace of God, right? Notice it says here, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. First category, prophecy, in accordance to the proportion of faith. Second category, service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, a a a prophecy speaking gift, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation, another speaking gift. Then he moves to serving gifts. He who gives with liberality, and that actually means with no agenda behind it or no strings attached in their giving. He who leads 
with diligence, not being lazy, not being slothful, not being stagnant. And he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, another serving gift. These little caveats that are given beyond when the gift is listed is because what Paul is trying to stress here is that if God gave you this gift, that is how you use your time wisely in the body of Christ. Be all about that gift. Invest yourself wholeheartedly. Throw yourself into it. Why? Because if it's been graciously and sovereignly given to you by God, then it is His means through you by which we go about serving Christ and by which He will receive the most glory. I mean, think about it. If you're not serving Christ spiritually in the way that He has equipped you to do so, what are you doing? How are you going about? Well, we'll figure this one out, but we don't pray. Well, I've got a plan, but we don't research the word. Well, here's how I think it ought to go. Because for some reason, the brain matter in the room was the greatest consensus available. Hey, if I'm in the room, that's not the case. Okay? Lacking here. It's not a good way to go. But if God has said, you know what, I've blessed this person and this person and this person and this person and this person, and I've made sure, and this is how he determines this, I've made sure that there are segments in the body of where at least one of every spiritual gift has been indwelt with them to use, then that means that the body of Christ is never going to be deficient in any work that he prepared beforehand that we need to walk in to glorify him most. God has a plan. For Grace Bible Church. Evangelism and discipleship are the two areas of which that plan flows out of. There is nothing else. But what that looks like and how we go about ministering it, that's where the spiritual gifts bring the divine presence of the Lord working through it, drawing off his word in order to do so, and it characterizes that ministry for its unique purpose. God is intentional about wanting to work through the local church. And I don't know about you. And I'll go ahead and say it, but while many people are teaching something other than the Bible, I've heard churches going through, uh, we're going to play a U2 song and we're going to tell you why it matters. I don't know if you're going to get this joke, but those people still have not found what they're looking for, okay? Some of you do. Some of you are like, he's crazy. Never mind. Some people spend a lot of time and we're just going to do good people, do good things for people, and they're so invested in social issues. Let me tell you this. Apart from the word of God, we do not know how to handle social issues. It's us, again, doing the best that we can. But God, sit on the sideline. We'll take care of it. That's what spiritual gifts are for. Because God is to be intimately and intricately tethered into the very fabric of the church. His mission, not mine. Today we're talking about mercy. If you have your spiritual gift inventory sheet, and I'm, I'm meaning to print more of these out and the, the statements that go with them, and, and by the time we're done with this study, which will probably be uh, February dealing with. Don't have one? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Dale, would you mind to look back there on that card and see if we have any of these? We might not have any, D, and if we don't, get with me afterwards so I can print you out some, okay? Uh, but again, if you need some, come up and let me know after we're done. I will try to get these printed up. It'll take about... I don't know, five, seven minutes to get these printed out of the printer. Uh, But if we happen to have more, you know what? I'll give you mine, okay, for the time being. But if you look under the designation that is H, everybody see H right here? Mercy, right in mercy. That's what we're looking at so far, mercy. So H for mercy. Let's give you a definition. Now, here's what's interesting. If you go to the lexicons on this word, Elios, Elias, uh, Elio uh, is a Greek word for it. The lexicons just give you two things, mercy, pity. That's it. And I thought, well, okay, thank you. So I went to some other sources to find out. Some of you own Vine's Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words. This is a Vine's definition, the gift of mercy. The outward manifestation of pity. It assumes need on the part of him who receives it, and resources adequate. See, it's not just the recognition of a deficiency that needs to be met. 
It's recognizing that you are used by God, either within yourself or outside of yourself, to be a filter through it, to bring adequate resources to meet the need on the part of him who shows it. Now, I checked with another person. His name is Kenneth Woost, and he's actually retranslated the New Testament in an incredibly literal translation. And here's a definition he gave to this word for mercy. Sympathy with the misery of another, especially such sympathy which manifests itself in action less frequently in word. That's why this is a serving gift. It's not necessarily a speaking gift. Here's what's interesting. If you translate the Greek word back and you want to say, where did it come from in in the Hebrew? Can anybody take a guess what Hebrew word might be for the New Testament word of mercy? No. Loving kindness. Hesed. So when we say his loving kindness is everlasting, what are we saying in New Testament terms? His mercy is everlasting. And notice, if we understand Hesed in the Old Testament as a loyal love, notice that there is a sympathetic, deep-seated, moving component that propels the person with the gift of mercy to get involved. Now, raise your hand if you're a believer in Christ and you're not supposed to be merciful. See, the running joke in our elder retreat in January was, well, I scored really low in the gift of mercy. That's okay. One of the great things that plagues us when we go through a spiritual gifts inventory like that is we say, well, yes, I wish I was that person. It's okay that you're not if God didn't give you the spiritual gift of mercy. But does that give you a, well, I'm just not supposed to be merciful to anybody? No. When I was in Bible college, I took a youth ministry 101 class, and my teacher was a guy who was Jerry Falwell's youth minister for years. And this guy had like, you know, my youth group is 3,000. I was like, oh, is that all? That kind of thing, right? And he would often say, I don't have the spiritual gift of mercy. Is that an excuse? No. I'll go ahead and tell you. He was a jerk. He was a jerk to everybody in his class. Learned a little from that man. Because it doesn't matter how big your youth group is. It matters if you're after the heart of God. That's what matters. So no Christian is exempt from displaying and demonstrating mercy. But there are certain people that have been sprinkled throughout the body of Christ who God is specifically geared to satisfy that deep, sympathetic need that needs to be met within the body of Christ. If you have your paper here, there is a typo on it. We'll get to it in a second. If you have your paper in your bulletin, this is <laughs> Rodmacher's study. Spiritual gifts, if you want to know about that, I explained it a couple of Sundays ago. He says the God-given ability to be sensitive or empathetic to people who are in affliction or misery, and to lift internal burdens with cheerfulness. Isn't it interesting? It says the gift of mercy with cheerfulness. Why? Because a lot of times these situations will bring a lot of people to their knees, will overwhelm them with depression. Can Christians experience depression? Yes. David did often read the Psalms. God, where are you? How come you're not listening to me? And how come my enemies are gaining a foothold on this situation? Where are you? Help! Does he sound discouraged and depressed? Absolutely. The person with the spiritual gift of mercy that comes in and meets that need. The person with the spiritual gift of mercy is bringing the salve that is desperately needed to heal up the body of Christ. What is this person like? Well, number one, they're very perceptive to people in need. Number two, They find it hard to say no when asked for help. Now let me tell you, that's a strength and it's a liability. Because a lot of times they end up agreeing to things that maybe they shouldn't have been in or because the story, let me say it this way, because the storyteller has crafted the story for so long, right? If you just get me that hotel room for a couple of nights, I'll pay you back on Thursday. I'm so sick of hearing that. I want to be like, no, you're a swindler and and get off my phone. 
kind of thing. Because that's really what it comes down to. They just want, just want you to help them. They have no intention of doing anything. They don't want to hear about it. They'll, they'll listen to your Jesus. They don't want anything about your Jesus. They'll take your Bible. They're not going to read your Bible. So in a situation like that, they find themselves saying yes to pretty much everything that comes along because they're so propelled emotionally to be involved. Next, they jump in quickly to help. And sometimes without evaluating it fully, they find themselves in a little bit deeper than what they thought it would have been. <coughs> Big one, they lay aside personal desires and personal plans to help others. And notice here says to help others over and over again. I could say redundancy is a good teacher, but no, it's a typo. So just mark it out. But it's often whatever they were going to do, it's obviously not as important as the need that has presented itself right in front of me. And so they sacrifice that. The next one, they're a peacemaker. They don't like friction. Instead, they want to be the person that comes in and is able to bring everything in that to a, a resolve. The next one. It says here, they avoid arguments and controversial situations. That's not where they're needed. They don't want any part of that. Also, they rely heavily on feelings. Sometimes they hold them inside. Now, they rely heavily on feelings. Remember, emotions aren't a bad thing, but emotions aren't the foundation of truth. They, they just are. They just are what they are. And hopefully they're a successful and, and pure representative of what somebody's going through. But they're not a foundation for truth. Somebody who would rely too heavily on their feelings and let that dictate their actions, that's where their F train's out of whack, if you guys remember that one. The next one, love people despite their faults. They can look past the impurity of whatever it might possibly be. They're recognizing, yeah, the sin is sin, but the sin doesn't keep you from loving the person. See, oftentimes in the Old Testament, you see somebody with leprosy, you run. They would have to cry out, unclean, unclean. Everybody's like, yep, we're going this way. Because they don't want anything to do with them. There have been some people who have been sick with COVID in our church. Some of you go, you want to help. Some of you feel propelled to help, but you don't help. And that's okay. I'm not slamming anybody for that. You may not have that gift or, or God's not laid it on your heart to do that. There are some people who say, you know what, I don't care. I'm getting in the thick of it because I love this person and they need assistance. They need nurturing. They need encouragement at this time. They need to be loved on. It's the person who wants to supply those things. Some of you have been very gracious to my family in doing that. Thank you. Thank you for being and exercising that spiritual gift of it as it's needed. The next thing is they're cheerful people. They have a very positive outlook on a situation. Why? I, I tell you what, for those who are mature in their faith, it's because they understand that their spiritual gift is meant to bring that nurturing and that need they want to satisfy that for people because they know that God will use them to do that. Man, that's, a, that's an amazing confidence that you can't buy. God wants to use me to do this, and this is how he's equipped me to do this. That's a confidence that's unshakable. The last one here, they try to find the best in people without doubting them. They never want to bring that into a situation. In fact, I'd say it this way. A lot of times when we deal with the idea of mercy in the church and we should be a people of mercy, we find that a lot of times for people in the church, they react when they hear a need with mercy, because that's the way we should. Sometimes we do that. Well, this is the way as a Christian I should be, and so we react for that. The people who have the spiritual gift of mercy are out looking for people to be merciful to. They're on a hunting mission. Who's hurting and how can I be there? They want to know. They immediately think of what is it that I have that I can part with for the betterment of that person to lift their spirits and to bring them up. That's a person with the gift of mercy. Maybe this is you. Maybe it resonates with you. Let's look at three little sections. I'm going to try to move briskly. And so if everybody would loosen up your fingers so we can get through the New Testament here and look at some of these things. And then I want to give you a, a very prime example of what it is to be someone with the gift of mercy. First thing is we need to understand mercy because God is merciful. If God doesn't set the standard for what mercy is, then we have no means of ever grasping or categorizing it in a way that is understandable to us. Again, there are many numerous ways we can look at, but we're only going to look at two for each one of these categories I have. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is turn your Bibles to Ephesians. Turn to the right to Ephesians. You'll hit 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians. I want you to look at chapter 2. Ephesians 2. In the grand scope of Ephesians 2, Paul starts out by letting us know that we're all dead in our trespasses and sins when we start out. We're not just sinners by what we do. 
we're sinners in our constitution. Or other words, we're not just sinners in conduct, we're sinners in our condition. The problem is much more deep-seated than I need to get my act together. Much more. So Paul lays that out for us to understand and actually tells us, you know, something that may not seem comfortable with us, but we're actually all under the influence of Satan when we're born into this world. You don't believe that for very long? Try telling a three-year-old what to do and see the response that you get. You know that's not from God, right? It's not. Are we not going to laugh this morning? If we're not, it's going to be a bad day. I'm just going to let you know. Have mercy on me, please. But I want to start in verse 4 because verse 4 is is an excellent transition. And we're going to see how does God demonstrate mercy. Verse 4. But God being, what's it say? Rich in what? Stop and think about that for a second. God is eternal, yes. Always has been, always will be. And God is immutable, meaning he never changes. How long has God been rich in mercy? God's been wealthy in mercy ever since before we could ever possibly fathom in our brains. That's just who he is. His bank account is exploding in mercy. Now, what does that manifestation of mercy look like? But God being rich in mercy because of his great what? Love with which he loved who? Stop for a second. Grasp it. Think about it. Let it let it marinate for a minute. There's incredible connection between mercy and love. God is the one who establishes that. Is God obligated to save anyone? Not a person. In fact, we would call that his justice. God is perfectly just letting us all end up in the lake of fire. Nobody could say a word against him. Why? Because we're the ones who did wrong and we would be getting what we deserve. That is justice. If we were getting beyond what we deserve, that's normally called revenge. That's why we're not to take our own vengeance. We're to hand it over to God and let him deal with somebody who's wronged us. He can do it exactly. He can do it justly, not us. When we talk about mercy, we're talking about someone not getting what they deserve. I deserve all this horrible stuff. Yes, but you're not getting that. We're actually bringing you back up to a level playing field in this. Well, God, who is rich in mercy, and because his love motivates him to move forward, not just in any old nebulous general way, specifically in our lives. Us. It's very personal. Notice it says here, he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions. Is that not Romans 5.8? Right? God demonstrates his love for us, and that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we were on the opposite end of the spectrum, God said, no, no. My love compels me, and because he is rich in mercy, he wanted to do something about our horrible estate. What does he do? It says he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. What does God's rich mercy do when it's compelled by his love? He makes dead people alive. That's what he does. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've experienced that. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, he wants you to experience that. And he's given you all the provision to make it possible in your life. How about the next example here? Titus 3. Turn to the right, please. Titus 3. Let me give you some examples here of God's mercy and how he establishes this for us. It's right before Hebrews and Philemon. Titus 3 foundational and incredible verse again mercy is latched onto the idea of saving dead people saving the lost chapter 3 verse 5 he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness are any of our deeds done in righteousness apart from the lord none no matter how good you thought it was it wasn't good enough to merit anything with god Because he's holy and he's perfect. But what happens after that? Look what it says. But according to his mercy. And everybody see according to? Imagine you're getting out your ruler in order to try to measure it. According to, how do I measure this out? You're probably going to need more of a ruler or a very large ruler, right? According to God's mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Regeneration is meaning that we have been born from above. Yes, I've changed my stance on that. It does mean born from above. 
Thank you, Emily, for correcting me for a long time on that. That hurts. But anyway, <laughs> she was right. I was wrong. Praise be to God for his word. But it says right here, washing of regeneration, that's being born again. So his mercy is what brings us to be born again. When you hear the gospel and you believe it, at that moment, the Holy Spirit causes you to be born again. He regenerates you. Notice it says after that, not just regenerating us, but and renewing by the Holy Spirit. In other words, according to his mercy, he doesn't just take care of making us alive again from the dead, but he makes sure that as we grow in our Christian walk, that by his mercy, the Holy Spirit is involved in our lives in order to perpetuate and encourage us forward in the word. That's why we pray for the Holy Spirit to give us illumination and discernment when we read the Bible. We need it. How do we get that? Why is it even available in our lives? Because of his mercy. It's according to, it's measuring out his mercy towards us. He makes that possible. Second thing we need to understand, mercy in relation to people. What does the Bible tell us about a person-to-person mercy scenario? Turn with me back to the left of Philippians. Again, I give you these passages. We want to talk about them briefly. But I give you these passages because... I want you to be able to look them over in your spare time throughout the week. Maybe you spend your quiet time honed in on each one of these. I mean, I'm I'm going to give you six of these, so you've got, you know, Monday through Saturday covered, right? When you come here on Sunday, you're good. I want you to invest in these. Philippians 2, look at verse 25. Paul says, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Notice how he describes him, my brother, my fellow worker. And fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. In other words, Epaphroditus is a member of the church in Philippi. And he's come for some reason that he wants to minister along Paul in his need. Now watch what happens here. Verse 26. Because he was longing for you all. Does everybody see the heart there? He's got a longing for you all. He longs for the Philippians. And was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Now stop. How many times when you're sick are you worrying about other people? Well, they heard I was sick. I'm kind of concerned how they're going to take that news. Do we knew that? We, no, we go NyQuil, please. Don't we? Let's be honest. When we're sick, we're very selfish and, and self-focused. All the wives are going, yes, when my husband's sick, he's very selfish and self-focused. He's such a baby. I even had to say to my wife after having COVID and six days in, I said, have you noticed I'm not very needy with this? She's like, yes, praise God, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because she knows I don't get sick often, but I'm on the verge of almost needing diaper changes. It's terrible anyway. (laughs) Moving on. That's gross. Forget that. All right. (laughs) Verse 27, four. Here's an explanation. Look what it says. Indeed, he was sick to the point of death. He almost died. Now, I want you to think about this. I'm going to say something. You're not going to agree with it. Pray about it. Search the word. Think about it. Indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God, is that the difference maker? Had what? Had mercy on him. And not only on him, also, but also on me. So that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. In other words, even though I'm in this afflicted state, in the Philippians, you are sending ministry helps to me whether it's financial whether it's food whatever it might possibly be to encourage him and you're doing so through Epaphroditus he got sick while he was with me and he was sick to the point of death he almost died and the most thing that he was worried about while he was on death's door was how you guys were going to take the news about his sickness because he didn't want you to be sad or overcome with that situation man that's a gracious heart Epaphroditus has the gift of mercy but notice what it says but god had mercy on him in other words if this tells us something about god in relation to us get this it is only by god's mercy that anyone becomes well from a sickness now that's a little hard to stomach because we take medicine all let's let me be honest with you if i get sick and if i died that wouldn't necessarily be a wrong thing would it no, and in, in fact, if I really want to think about my constitution apart from God as a sinner, I'd probably say, yeah, I kind of deserved that. Now, the great thing is I close my eyes here, I open them, I see Jesus, praise God. Whether I'm in the body or whether or not, that's fine. 
But the fact that anybody is made well, the mercy of God is in the midst of that. When our bodies are restored, when they're made whole again, I mean, we're all falling apart, let's be honest. You hit 30, it's all going downhill. It is. And I'm not trying to depress anybody. But apart from the mercy of God, don't even play. Okay, Jay, you don't even have an argument there. Everybody knows it, just enough. It's only by the mercy of God that we're made well. It's his mercy. That's why if we're sick, praise God. If he provides healing, we say praise God. It's his mercy involved in people's lives. We might even want to say it's a common grace that he lavishes on us for no reason. How about the next one here? Turn over to Jude right before Revelation, all the way to the right. If you hit maps, you went too far. Jude. I'm going to go just a tad bit long. Forgive me. Packers don't play till after three. You're okay. Don't burst a juggle or anything. <coughs> Jude, verse 20, right before the book of Revelation. And I want you to see this because there's a double mention of mercy in two different facets. It's very interesting. Jude is writing, he says, but you, beloved, saved or unsaved, Save people, brothers and sisters in Christ. Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. We might want to say this from John 15 terms. Abide. Remain in the love of God. Now stop for a second. That tells you that there are Christians who can get out of the love of God. That's important because this takes us back to Jesus' teaching. Uh, in the upper room discourse. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. What is he saying here? Keep obeying. Keep demonstrating your love for God by obeying his word. In the Bible, love is manifested because of obedience. That's what happens. It's not just a feeling. It's an action in play. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Wait a second, he called them beloved. I thought they were already saved. Why are they waiting for eternal life? Because they're talking about the manifestation of eternal life out in the future. Do we have eternal life right now when we believe in Christ? Absolutely we do. Is eternal life something that we can experience right now as we cultivate our fellowship with the Lord? Absolutely it is. But is it also something in our glorification that we're looking out forward to? Yes, it is. We will know more fully at that time. But stop. What does he call mercy here? Back up and look. You're waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. This is a glorification passage. Notice that he calls the rapture mercy. Why is it his mercy? Because he's saving us from the wrath of God during the seven-year tribulation. So notice the rapture is distinguished here as mercy that would happen in somebody's life. That's more end times, what we're going to look at for a second next. But look what happens after that. Verse 22, And have mercy on some who are doubting. False teachers have crept into the church, and maybe they got a little messed up on the basics of the faith. Don't ridicule them. Don't revile them. Have mercy on them. And restore to them the sound doctrine. Notice the next tier of people. It says here, Save others, verse 23, Snatching them out of the fire. In other words, what's a fire? Well, they're on danger of going to hell. No, they're saved people. They can't lose their salvation. They're going, to, they're going to have a stricter judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. Keep them from that. Pull them from that. Do everything in your power to point them in a direction of holiness. Get rid of that mess that they bought into. How about the next one? And on some, here's the third tier, have mercy with fear. In other words, have a humble reverence in relation to dealing with them because the extent of falsehood and sin that they've obviously gotten involved in. How do we know that? Have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Because they were led astray in such a way where they lived a fleshly life. Guess what? They need mercy. Here's the thing. Because of time, I'm not going to be able to hit this. But if you wouldn't mind, write them down. God's mercy is also shown in relation to the end times. I'll give you both of those passages. 2 Timothy 1, verses 16 through 18. 2 Timothy 1, 16 through 18. 
and also James 2, 12 and 13. James 2, 12 and 13. How does mercy play a factor in the end times for the believer? Turn with me to Luke 10. We'll finish here. Let me give you a great quote that I found from a guy named Miley. He wrote it in a systematic theology. Can we bring that up, PJ? Mercy is a form of love determined by the state or condition of its objects. Their state is one of suffering and need, while they may be unworthy or ill-deserving. Mercy is at once the disposition of love respecting such and the kindly ministry of love for their relief. Does everybody see in your own salvation of your desperate need for a Savior how Jesus Christ is perfectly merciful. Does everybody see that? Jesus told a story to a lawyer who wanted to try to ridicule him and accuse him and test him in order to debunk him. You got all these commandments and everything. Which one should we keep? You know, what, what are we talking about here? What's the greatest thing? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he asked this question. And if he really knew who Jesus was, he probably wouldn't have taken it any further. He probably would have said, Thank you for this great, beautiful wisdom from the Word of God, Old Testament, obviously. I'm very thankful for that. He thought he would press it. And it's very interesting because we see in Luke 10, in verse uh, 29, he says, but wishing to justify himself. In other words, he had something to prove. And his pride got in the way and he pressed the situation with Jesus. And he says, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells probably one of the most famous stories that we've ever seen to prove a point. Look at verse 30. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, why is that important? Number one, it tells us that the man who was going down was probably Jewish because he's traveling between these two Jewish cities. Number two, between Jerusalem and Jericho is a 17-mile stretch. And it was known as a place that you didn't even want to go during the day. Okay, So this stretch between Jerusalem and Jericho and probably East St. Louis held the same type of... uh, parameters there. Anybody been through East St. Louis? No, there's a reason why you haven't. You have? You're never going to go again, are you? No, scary during the day, okay? So that's that type of place. This was all full of twisty paths, all kinds of rocks where people could hang out, and it was known that if you traveled this road, you were likely going to get beat down and robbed when it happened. That's just what it was known for, okay? We also, why does he say go down? Because Jerusalem is a higher elevation than what most of the places were around there. So anytime you see that it's going down from that, you know that somebody is coming from Jerusalem and say we had to go up to Jerusalem. It's because they're going up in elevation, okay? So it says here, he fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, and if you like to write in your Bible to note this, number one, a priest was going down, so he's coming away from Jerusalem, heading towards Jericho, going along the same way, on the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A priest. Well, maybe he didn't want to defile himself because that excuse? No? Doesn't sound very priestly. Notice it says here, verse 32, likewise a Levite also When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. How do we feel about that? Now, let's not get self-righteous. Put yourself in the situation. This guy didn't have any clothes on. This guy didn't have nothing. He's got wounds everywhere. He's bleeding everywhere. He can't even stand up. Somebody, I don't even remember where I read this. Somebody ran a test one time for seminary students who were in a doctoral program, right? So the creme de la creme, right? I can't even say French. Is that French? Whatever. Moving on. In doing so, they said, you know, we want you to travel from your school. And if you wouldn't mind, walk over here to this building because there we've got some pertinent information for your doctoral exam that's going to come up at the end of your program. They had 40 of them. And so they sent them off. Christianity Today, back when it actually believed in Jesus, published this years ago, okay? They sent him off in that. And as they went, they had staged a man who was in shabby clothes, hadn't shaved, really just, you know, everywhere is all a mess. 
And when they would come up, he would actually slump over and fall over on the ground because they wanted to see. What are these incredibly knowledgeable seminary students going to do who are going to be leading the next generation of churches? 75% of them walked around the man and a few of them even stepped over him to get where they were going. Only about 25% stopped to try to be some sort of help to demonstrate mercy. They didn't rationalize, well, he's probably just drunk and he's getting what he deserved. Well, he's probably all strung out on fentanyl and this is what needs to happen. They weren't trying to rationalize anything in their hearts. They actually took the time to stop and to be Jesus very practically in this person's life. So now you have a third character that walks onto the scene and he's a Samaritan. Now here's the thing. This person we saw in verse 30 is a Jewish man. The last person he wants to see in his life is a Samaritan. Why is that? Because a Samaritan is a half-breed. Because a Samaritan is somebody who is made up of Gentile and Jewish descent. Because of Samaria that stood in between Galilee and Judea, they would actually cross over the Jordan River and travel up to the Sea of Galilee to avoid this area and go through. This is why whenever Jesus turns around and looks at his disciples and says, we have to go through Samaria, they're all like, <laughs> right? Jesus, what are you doing? We can't go through there. Those people are damned. They actually considered God needed firewood for hell. That's why we have Samaritans. That's why we have Gentiles. They're dogs. They're detestable. They're garbage. They're trash. So what does it say? Verse, verse 33. But a Samaritan who was on a journey, what does that tell you? He's got plans. He's got an agenda. He's on his way to do something. He's got a schedule mapped out. So this is going to be a major inconvenience for him. He might actually have to stop his life to help give life to somebody else. Look at this. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt, what's the word? It's not the same word that we're finding for mercy from our passage, but it is often translated compassion and mercy, and here's what it means. Some, some actually said he had a feeling in his bowels, and that's kind of weird for us. His kidneys were moved. It's the idea that your gut just can't stay still, and it thrusts you forward to be the living difference in somebody's life. Deep compassion that motivates somebody. I can't walk on and do nothing. I can't. I have to be involved. It's somebody with the gift of mercy. And he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. Is oil and wine cheap in the first century? No. Pouring it on him, lavishing it on his wounds to take care of them. And he put him on his own beast. You know what that means? If it's a 17-mile journey, we don't know where they were in the midst of that. But here's what we know. The Samaritan walked the rest of the way in favor of putting this man on his beast so he didn't have to walk. Notice it says here, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. I don't know if you've seen the prices at Best Western lately, but good gravy. Personal cost. And it says here that on the next, uh, sorry, brought him to an inn and took care of him. It means he spent time with him. He didn't just drop him off and get him a bed and walk on. He made sure he was taken care of. On the next day, he took two denarii. If you notice your marginal note, that's what somebody at that time would make in two days' pay. Took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Would we dare go that direction with our finances? Moses, well, no, we don't know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. That's just too uncertain. It's kind of like whenever Paul told Philemon, Whatever it's cost you because of what on on Onesimus did, put it on my account. I will pay for it. Only people with the gift of mercy venture out into those gracious waters. Notice he says here, verse thirty six. Jesus turns and asks this man the question. Watch, he's told the story, and immediately it had to get under their skin. Their, their, their skin. A Samaritan? You mean that piece of junk? Is the one who's the difference maker in a Jewish man's life impossible? They're thoroughly racist in their culture. Notice what happens. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Good question, isn't it? Answer's undeniable, right? So what does the lawyer say? And he said, the one who showed 
There's our word, mercy. The one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Church, go and do the same. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for mercy. Mercy that you've had on us in our salvation. Mercy that is exercised within the body of Christ. Mercy that is so necessary in the end times. Mercy that is demonstrated in this small story, but powerful story that Jesus tells us. Mercy is a commodity that our world and culture desperately needs. And we are to be your hands and your feet. Lord, raise up in our midst people with the spiritual gift that you've given them of mercy, that they can minister, that the Holy Spirit can work through them in incredible ways, that people's lives would be spiritually, divinely, supernaturally impacted, that they would do so with cheerfulness, recognizing that they live for a greater hope than whatever this world's trying to offer us. We thank you, God, that in another spiritual gift, we see that you are full of a blessing, wanting to equip your body for this work of ministry. Thank you that it is coupled with love, that it is something that is ignited within a person that drives them forward. How desperately we need to experience the mercy so that we will be edified and built up and grow by it. Father, thank you for your holy word and how it instructs us in mercy. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.